Uh, this is a tweaked version of a recent poem, and we got a carnival thing going. Poem! This poem will not save you. You will soon return to your mundane humdrum beats, meeting the grumbling pavement in uncertain, persevering steps. If this poem somehow douses you with Gallagher's splashing smiles, it was unintentional. This poem expects to fail you, like trigonometric binomials evading the groping grasp of last year's Jersey Shore cast, or like how the cow goes moo for W. You see, this poem's shooting for crack rock bottom, carefree based, whiskey guzzled mumbles about how its dad was never there and why the system made it happen. This poem has problems. Tough trouble tightening its jittery red bull edges that tension in tandem with its twitching hands. Its weary eyes recall a long ago home but misplaced the directions. Lost and wandering, poem doesn't need you. It's glad to be on its own. Poem phases in and out of seedy syringe phrases, a cacophony of backstreet rap sheet confusion. Littered with loose eclectic alliteration, poem loves letting it all hang loose. You'd literally hope poem would at least link its illogical lines, some linearly literary, some linearly literary theme, but its lobes are liquefied by brown, brown, and glue, eager to let down itself and you. But under poem's cardboard cut seat cutout, reeking of partially digested thoughts and lighter fluid, its crooked teeth smile their latent charm. Its friends tell Poem they're worried it's washed and it's wasting a tired life. They just want to see Poem get better. But it exhales assuredly. Poem has nothing left to lose and can only improve from here. This next one, this next one we have to thank uh, a Mr. Danny Strack. This is the Cloud Carnival of Cairo. I was looking for an escape. Got to talking to this dock worker who said he knew of a place I could get away to. He told me of the Clown Carnival of Cairo, where runaway animals hold an eternal circus in the sky. In fact, he said, it's that cloud right there. And that all sounded pretty unbelievable to me. I said, if it's a carnival from Cairo, what's it doing above Montana? And he said, it floated here. And that was enough for me. How can I get up there, I asked him. And he sold me what he told me was giant dragonfly egg, which then hatched in my hands, and huge wings unfolded to a ten-foot span. The insect, the insect took hold of my shoulders, then we took off up through the clouds, only to emerge above them, to sunlight streaming across a fantastic cloudscape Serengeti, where I saw intelligent elephants and gazelles and glasses, grazing on wispy white grass, and then we were zooming above a soft, fluffy pad. So I struggled my shoulders, and when the insect let go, I landed like a teddy bear in a toilet paper commercial, rolling through a somersault in a cartwheel in a carnival archway where the world turned cotton candy. And I saw forked flags waving from ten top towers, and then came all the eight brass band parading down the lane, playing irresistible da 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 endlessly looping da 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 and I forgot I was a, a human as I took up a spare set of symbols and clashed crashing after them, joined them, enchanted, pulled, past tent flaps and into the enormous center ring, where we wove through spiraling concentric circles of colorful critters in silly circus costumes. The outermost edge made up of monkey minds trapped in a train of invisible boxcars, chugging silently around a ring of ballerina horses in tutus on two legs, leaping and rotating pirouettes as they circled a circle of seven elephants, clowns on tricycles, spraying water from fire hoses, noses up into the air where acrobatic lions and tigers and bears wearing spandex were swinging by their teeth from stealing trapezes and floating in the focus in the center of it all was the ringmaster magician chicken clucking commands and proclamations to her animal disciples. And I was below, within, looking up, amazed, still dancing and playing in the primate parade. But when we reached the center, I abandoned the band to pedal with the painted pachyderms instead, and as we came around again for second circle, I realized that I finally found my place in the world. I found the cloud carnival of Cairo. I joined the eternal, eternal animal circus in the sky. This was the happiest day of my life. Now, how am I supposed to get down from this cloud?
the dark and dusty stacks looks a figure most grotesque gnarled hands and crooked back tis past midnight man you mind you now all the librarians have gone to their homes all the patrons young and old have since left with cherished tones trails of slobber and bits of grime often can be found early in the morning all the building round but strangest trace of this very odd creature that most have never seen were errant piles of children's books, all gnawed on by teeth quite mean. Now Jane, the head librarian, spoke, we must put a stop to this. Whether it's rats or bats or library cats, if it keeps up, we'll have nothing left but an abyss. As time went on, many books were gone, chewed till their bindings were flaps. The boa constrictor that ate my lunch was one, the ugly duckling, a pile of scraps. But when blueberries for Sal was not to tatters, Jane's ire reached a peak. Her favorite book left unreadable, so angry she could barely speak. I'll get to the bottom of this, she shrieked. The staff, they cowered at their desks. I know what I'll do. I know who can help. I'll talk to custodian Rex. 
Now, Custodian Rex was a genial sort. He was built like a broom or a mop. Long and lanky with bristly blonde hair, he cleaned all night, non-stop. Head librarian Jane called Custodian Rex into her office one morn as he was about to depart. Rex leaned on his mop, his hat in his hand, fear of Jane's wrath in his heart. Custodian Rex, said Jane with a frown, we have a problem, I'm sure you're aware. Someone's eating our books, whether rat or bat. You must track it down to its lair. Yes, I've seen the chewed books, Rex replied. I've cleaned up the pages, the scraps and the tatters. But who's done the damage? That's a whole different matter. Well, tonight when you work, hissed Jane, with a hideous gleam in her eye, we'll set traps for this dastardly fiend. Nets and deadfalls, bear traps and spikes, maybe a poison peach pie. I'll get right on it, ma'am, drawled Rex. I'll put in some overtime at that. We can't let this situation continue. Can't let him chew up the cat in the hat. That night, Jane joined Rex midst the books. They had everything ready. All the traps had been set. Crouching beneath a copy of James and the giant peach, they each had a flashlight and a big baseball bat. It was right around midnight when they heard it. Out of the gloom hobbled a stooped little fellow, smacking his lips, making slobbery grunts, carrying a pile of books, the one on top, Cinderella. They both dropped their sandwiches, which Jane had provided, and rushed towards the squat little man. Swinging their bats and throwing their nets, they watched as the troll turned and ran. Dropping books as he went, he scurried out the door, his movements surprisingly quick. Rick shouted at him, don't come back now, you hear, or I'll beat you with a big stick. That's the last we'll see of him, said Jane. That old troll wasn't the least bit tough. But they, say he, but they saw he'd made off with one of their books disappearing into the night, heading toward Blacktail Mountain with their copy of Three's Billy Gold Scrub. Process. I am a process, a mixture of chemical, 
Chemicals bonded together to perform an action, never static, always changing. I move between the space of what is. I take form, yet I am formless. Like liquid poured into a cup, I become the shape of my surroundings, yet I remain distinct. I am a form of my own creations, but I have the imagination to create. A product of, a product of life, yet I, have the, um, yet I have the power to create life and make it my own. Mother, daughter, friend, teacher, student, poet, photographer. I am all of these, and yet I am none. Indefinable. I am but one element in the process called life. And this next one is called Snow Globe. Tiny white flakes falling all around me. They grow larger by the minute. The wind picks up speed and throws snow in my eyes. I am blind. My world has been turned upside down. I am a piece of sand trapped inside an etch-a-sketch that is being shaken by a child. Sand everywhere. I am caught in the eye of the storm. Where do I go from here? I have lost the forest while searching for the trees I have yet to find. I look to the sky for answers, so certain the universe has some secret for me to discover. Flakes falling faster, growing larger. They bury me in their billowy whiteness, swirling, turning all around me. A distant light appears through the dark clouds. It shines down upon me like a spotlight. Time slows as I begin to dance in a circle. Oh, I'm <laughs> The flakes seem to hang in the air. They reflect off one another like a million tiny holograms. I start to spin faster. My mind becomes dizzy with the promise of infinite possibilities. Falling to the ground with a sigh of relief, I no longer care about the trees or the forest. I have discovered the truth that the universe has been trying to show me all along. The journey is far more important than the destination. And this one's got a science theme to it. <laughs> so um, it's called 10 times 10 to the 40th. At the heart of everything lies the mathematics of synchronicity. Chance events send ripples throughout the universe, causing a chain reaction of, event, of effects. Like dominoes toppling over toward infinity, they manifest themselves into infinite realities. Out of the infinite ways that the 10 times 10 to the 40th different particles can arrange themselves, we are but one arrangement. Random notes written on the musical scale of existence. Randomness is a cosmic DJ that spins the turntable of life. Everything that exists is born out of chaos, and that is beautiful. Random patterns generate through space and create a blade of grass, a tree, a sunset, a drop of water, the number times ten, the number ten times ten to the fortieth. How are we all doing? Yeah. Good. 
Man, this is beautiful. We got poets from all ages and walks of life up here. This is how it starts. So I have a poem here. It started out as a song, but I decided to do it for you. It's called Sad Beauty. It was a rainy night, water coming down on the city. It was late in the bar, the scene was smoky and gritty. She sat by herself looking sad, lonely, and pretty, and he watched from afar sipping on his whiskey. It was almost time to go, he was tipsy and broke, so he picked up his coat, headed for the door, and lit a smoke. As he walked by, he heard the words that she spoke, with tears in her eyes and strain in her throat, it almost sounded like there was a gleaming of hope. She said, I was wondering if you'd talk to me for a moment. I could really use a friend. I know that I show it just a little. So please sit for a minute. So he gave a shrug and started to listen. She said her father died several days ago. He fought cancer for years, but he finally let go. Her mother passed away when she was six years old, and her brother was killed fighting for freedom on foreign soil. Her dad was the last thing she ever had, and he couldn't help but feel a little bit sad. He noticed the backpack sitting next to her lap was packed to the max, and it was heavy and fat. He asked, what will you do now? She gave him a grin, said, I'll start over again, as a tear fell from her chin. She gave him a wink and said thanks, threw a pack on her back, and walked out of that place. He stumbled to his house, staggered to bed to lay down, thinking of his sad beauty as he passed out and dreamed about how bad the life was she was talking about. The next day after work, he turned on the TV and stood in disbelief at the story he seen. His sad beauty's face was all over the news. She disappeared without a trace and left no clues. Her father that died was a billionaire. She had inherited a fortune and disappeared in thin air. The mansion was empty, all her stuff was still there. Her call, all her jewels, and even scrunchies for her hair. They say she ain't been seen for three days, gone without a trace. She even had a winning ticket on the counter. Won the lottery jackpot, but they never found her. She had everything a person could ever want in this cruel life, but it was the simple thing she lost that made her take flight. So every time he thinks that his day is going bad, he thinks of his sad beauty, and all the beautiful things he still has. Yeah. Okay.